Shikhar, welcome. Thank you. Um, I thought, you know, we would love to hear about your personal journey of, uh, you know, school in the cloud. You went to school, obviously, and you went to PhD, uh, to do PhD in IIT Delhi. So, tell me a little bit about what happened there that sort of gave you the first taste of probably what it is to be on your own. Well, I, IIT Delhi was a long, long time ago, and um, I'll, I'll tell you about it in a minute. But uh, but this journey to the school in the cloud. Um, let me tell you, it's full of mosquito bites. Okay, so so the two sides to the story. There's the technology side, which is IIT. I was doing a PhD in physics, and I was trying to find out um, how electricity flows through things um, that are insulators that are not supposed to let electricity flow through them, um, and I used to use computers to, to simulate that process. Anyway, to cut a very long story short, what I uh, landed up finding at that time was that the shape of things determine what they do more than the content. You know, it doesn't matter what atoms are there inside a particular molecular structure, what matters is what shape is the molecule. And I found it through a little experiment. Um, uh, Sorry, before that, you said something wonderful happened when you went there regarding your guide. When I joined my PhD program, one of the most uh, fortunate things in my life happened, which is that my PhD supervisor said, um, you know, you've just joined and I feel a bit embarrassed to tell you, but I have got a visiting uh, fellowship in the United States and I'm going away. And I said, sir, um, don't hurry back. He went away for a couple of years, and those were the best years of my life. <laughs> in those days, um, I never saw a computer, because they were mainframes and they were somewhere in the underground. What we did was we, we used to write our programs on big stacks of punched cards, and go downstairs and give it to this lady, you know, rather nice looking lady, who used to then disappear with the cards. And then we used to go back 24 hours later and find a printout which is about that big and says, error in line 1132. <laughs> <laughs> and we did it all over again. So anyway, so I gave her the program that simulates the my mouse. And she never used to talk to any of us, you know. She used to be just silent. I still remember her like a robot. So uh, I went back to the robot the next day after giving the program in. And she said, what's that program about? So I said, why, why do you want to know? She said, you know the operator in the night? He said, the printer's making a chirping noise. It sounds a bit like a mouse running around. <laughs> you know, that's because the printer had to print out each of the mouse's movements, and the mouse was a simulated mouse, and it was going through this maze. So the printer was making a noise, like a mouse moving around. <laughs> and the operator got really psyched by it. <laughs> anyway, I did nothing with that program. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> But you did something where you came with the understanding of structure. And well, the understanding of structure, you know, there is a, there's a molecule. Uh, there's a molecule called um, copper thalocyanine. And copper thalocyanine, its only claim to fame is that it's, uh, that molecule uh, produces, is the dye which produces the blue of blue denim. So you have this whole lot of carbon rings, and then in the center, there's this copper sitting over there, and that gives you the blue of blue denim. And when you look at that structure, you'll find something very peculiar, that, uh, you know, our, our blood contains a substance called hemoglobin, and hemoglobin is also a thalocyanine, except that it has iron in the center. So these great big molecules, which are absolutely identical, one has copper, it's the blue of blue denim, the other has iron, and it's the hemoglobin of blood. And, uh, you know, and this was 1978. Uh, I had hair down to my knees, and I was thinking, man, denim and blood, just look at that, the same molecule. But why does one atom make that difference? So I was trying to figure that out, and I made a hypothetical molecule, and I said, what if the hemoglobin of blood 
were to look exactly like the hemoglobin of blood except that I take the iron out and put the copper in it. It doesn't exist, but if it did, what would it behave like? And the computer said it would behave like blue denim. So, so then I realized something quite fundamental. It's actually published somewhere way in the pre-internet days that the structure of a molecule, the design of the molecule, determines its function more than its constituents do. And that sort of stuck in my mind in, in many, many different contexts. I think if, if something goes right or if something goes wrong, and you think, what did I put in it? Is probably not the right question. The right question is, what shape was it in? So, you know, obviously you did more programming than physics, and yeah. you ended up at HCL, and then you oh, ended up yeah. at NIIT, uh, etc. And you actually, when you went to NIIT, you started experimenting with students because you said that you teach yeah, the same well, class over and over again. So, what are some of the things you started doing? As a physics student in 1978, with a with a PhD in theoretical physics, I had the option of becoming a teaching assistant or I could become a computer programmer and get paid 10 times as much. So all of us fresh PhDs in physics and math, we were the only guys who knew how to write code. So I went and joined uh, Hindustan Computers and then I went on to NIIT. and. Because I had a PhD, they said, you don't write programs, you should teach other people to write programs. And I got in to the most boring profession on this planet. Okay, and I said, man, I mean, this is not what I joined this job for. I thought I would write some cool computer programs. What am I doing with this bunch of 30 expectant faces staring at me with a blackboard behind? What am I supposed to say? You know, so what I did was, out of sheer frustration, I uh, brought the code, the basic language code for the game called Hangman. And I showed it to the class on day one. So they just, they said, what is it? I said, what is it? They, they said, well, it looks like a poem. So I said, well, but it's not in English, is it? So they said, no, it's not in English, but it looks like math lit written like a poem. So I said, well, that's called a program, and this is what it does. And Hangman started off, and they said, that does this? I said, yeah. And then Hangman hung. <laughs> because I put a bug in it. So it froze. And these guys said, oh, now what? So I said, you know, obviously there's a mistake in that program somewhere. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to leave this with you. You correct it. And the students were totally flabbergasted. They said, we didn't know anything about this. Next day morning, they said, we got it running. There was an initialization, blah, blah, something. N equal to zero was missing. So, so I said, well, you just corrected a program. You just debugged the program. I taught them basic, just doing that. And then I published it. And then Motorola picked it up. And I believe until even today, what they would do is every now and then to test their testing teams, they would put bugs into a program and give it to them and see how long they take to catch the bug, if at all. <laughs> so, so anyway, that was the story of my uh, career as a teacher, which mercifully ended. And it ended by you going to a newspaper. Well, it ended because I was, uh, you know, doing my thing in the classroom at NIIT when this guy came in and he had a letter. He said, there's an important letter for you. So I read this letter in the middle of the class, you know, everybody's staring at me and reading this letter. And the letter said, um, it's, it, it was from a, a, a newspaper called Patriot in Delhi and it had the Patriot logo and it said, we would like to appoint you as the head of our technology uh, operations. Um, so I said, well, what the, I mean, why should I? But uh, there was a signature at the bottom. And the signature was the signature of, I mean, I don't know if how many of you guys will recognize the name. It was the signature of Aruna Asafali. Aruna Asafali, uh, I can hear from a, a, a few people uh, sigh. Aruna Asafali is famous for what's known as the Chittagong Armory Raid. In the, in the 40s, uh, she went and raided a British armory, took the arms, 
and started the resistance movement in Bengal. And the way she was, so I said, you know, tell me about the Chittagong Armory Raid. I obviously took her offer immediately because of that signature. And she said, you know, those handguns, they're really heavy. And they, and they gave me two, not one. <laughs> so she was in this white sari with two of these submachine guns <laughs> raiding the army. But anyway, I worked for uh, several years for her. And I put in uh, India's first local area network uh, into Patriot. Uh, Mrs. Gandhi came to inaugurate it and uh, she looked at a, a, a photo typesetter and asked me, can you tell me how that works? So I still remember trying to explain um, uh, cathode rays to Indira Gandhi. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, all that worked out fine and then I got really bored because now the newspaper was coming Actually, out fine. Before we talk about that, there's something Mrs. Gandhi asked you to do. There was an interesting interaction. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, firstly, she said, can you keep it short? <laughs> and, and secondly, to, to, to two of us, I, I had a friend with me at that. Secondly, just before going, she said, shouldn't you have a haircut? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She said, uh, can you find out for me how to produce a newspaper internationally and instantaneously, like the International Herald Tribune? How does the technology work? And she sent me on a round-the-world trip trying to figure that out. Um, uh, and uh, she said, uh, well, she said someone's trying to kill me. So anyhow, so I, I went over there, gave her a handwritten report. It was about 20 or 30 pages long and it had diagrams and things about how data can travel over telephone lines. This was um, 1984. How data can travel over telephone lines and, uh, and that's how you, you do simultaneous transmission and then you feed it directly into a printing press and the printing press produces the paper and so on and so forth. And uh, I was waiting, I was saying, I'm going to get the job of my life. I'm going to produce this international connected paper. Three days later, she was dead. And with her went that handwritten report. Yeah. Well, it's pretty amazing that in some ways, uh, you know, both at Patriot as, uh, you know, as well as Indira Gandhi, I mean, they were all very farsighted and understanding that there's going to be this digital publishing, etc., which we take so for granted today. So now fast forward a, a few years, you know, with all this background, etc., you know, after Patriot, you went back to NIIT. Well, I, yeah. after Patriot, I went back to NIIT. In Patriot, I did uh, a kind of uh, reproduced uh, yellow page telephone directories into India. They, they didn't exist at that time, so I did the yellow pages of uh, Delhi, Bombay, Calcutta, uh, and Madras. I'm using the names they were called by at that time. All the directories, all their yellow pages, uh, also, also the yellow page of Bangalore. Um, uh, and uh, so it was all done with local area uh, networks of PCs. In the rest of the world, they were done with mainframes. So it was, you know, kind of in computing science, it was kind of uh, interesting for everybody to see how you do it. And then uh, that got done and I had nothing much left to do in the press, so I moved out again, came to NIIT and formed their uh, research and development center. And, uh, and we were doing all sorts of things, you know, all sorts of crazy stuff about, uh, well, you're doing it now, about uh, remote controlled vehicles that can move and be guided through the internet and how to stick electrodes on your head and see if you can move a mouse cursor using your thoughts alone. It didn't work. If you thought go right, it went left. But, but I tried. But it works now. <laughs> so it works now. So um, I did all of that. And in the meanwhile, I, I think close to 30 million people went through NIIT. And uh, many of them landed up in Silicon Valley, where I bump into them even now. So you have observed, you know, when you put just a computer with no instructions, leave it, how kids come and learn on their own. And, you know, after that, it led to you going to Newcastle. You've continued that experiment. I mean, since 2000, you've expanded on it more and more. Well, and more. I, I went off to Newcastle in 2006, and uh, I started working in the primary schools in uh, Gateshead, which is this uh, city across the river Tyne from Newcastle. And uh, in Gateshead, uh, along with a school teacher, I, uh, we invented the idea of a self-organized learning environment, which is a long uh, name for basically doing the hole in the wall inside a classroom. What is the hole in the wall? 
it's a chaotic, unsupervised uh, exercise with restricted resources. One computer, lots of children. You would think that that's not good, but it is far more powerful than one computer and one child. Um, many experiments show that. So in Newcastle that started and then it spread out, it kind of went viral and then souls started sprouting in, every, in all five continents. I've lost track of how many there are now, must be tens of thousands of teachers all over the world who try it. And then came the granny cloud, which was a, a loose group of people interested in children who would uh, come in over Skype and talk to children. Um, uh, and then I thought after the TED Prize, I thought why not put the self-organized learning environment and the granny cloud together and call it the school in the cloud. So there are seven of them, there are five in India, there are two in England. And how do you describe that? The, the, the easiest uh, description would be a driverless car. If you think about a driverless car, 30 or 40 years ago, a driverless car would be equal to a chaotic accident. The car would just go and dash against something. Today, a driverless car can drive itself. That's the difference the internet makes. If, if it can make that difference to driving, I don't see why it can't make that difference to education. So now you have these centers and you know basically the premise is that you put computers, there's a big glass wall so everything is seen so nobody can hide and do things and groups of children get around and your premise is that you just give children what to do but don't give them any instructions and by talking among themselves they'll figure it out. It reminds me of particle physics. The observer changes the observed. So don't go near, just leave them alone with their cloud. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.